swing and a high drive into center field. Hits at the wall. It is gone. Passes does it again. Again. It's gone. It's into the bullpen. This game is tied. This game is tied. And he swings and rips one to center field. It's high. It's deep. It's back. It's gone. Sale winds. He fires. Swing and a miss. Right play. It's over. The Red Sox have won. Welcome back to Play Tessie. It is episode 133. If you're listening on Drop Day, it is September 21st. This is the official Red Sox podcast of WEI. Before we get going, remember, hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe. Rate us five stars. It helps us out a ton. You get those notifications when episodes drop, which throughout the offseason, throughout the rest of the week and change you got left in this season, Gonna help you out so much because you want to hear our, our voices in your ears every time we drop an episode. As always, we're on YouTube on the WEI channel. You can find the Play Tessie playlist there, and all of our episodes are there in video form. And as always, on the socials, we are there at Play Tessie on both Twitter and Instagram. It is just me and the Hebrew Hammer himself, Sammy, and no Pat today. And Joe is is producing right now as we record. So, Sammy, I got to tell you, sort of expanding a little bit on the last show that we did, and as we get closer to the offseason, I mean, we're going to have so many of these discussions, like, as I said on the last show, too, like, you know us, we do our cooking at its best uh, when it's transaction time, when it's free agent time, and trade time, and trade deadline time, and man, this offseason, I feel like the name of this offseason is going to be trades, because we can talk over and over and over again about whether or not the Red Sox are going to spend. I'm always going to be from here on until it, until something changes. I'm going to believe it when I see it at all costs with spending. I don't know if it's going to happen, but the one thing that you're not going to be able to avoid is trading because whether it be the Red Sox have too many left-handed position or left-handed hitting position players, too many position players that are big league caliber players in its own right, Obviously, you have 40-man roster limitations. You're going to have 26-man roster limitations with guys who run out of options. Like The further you kick the can down the road, you know the further you risk having to sell guys at, at lower values, whether it be because they you know dip off performance-wise or whether it be because teams know that you got to trade these guys because none of them have options anymore. But I'm just going to list you some infielders and outfielders on the 40-man roster, and obviously you, you'll know – you know, the prospects that come behind it, but infielders on the 40 man roster right now, Tristan Costas, Romy Gonzalez, Vaughn Grissom, Nick Sogard, Emmanuel Valdez, Raphael Devers, David Hamilton, Trevor Story. Outfielders, and I'm leaving O'Neill off this because he's a free agent. Rob Refsnyder, Masataka Yoshida, Jaron Duran, William Abreu, Sedan Rafaela. And now you can add some prospects into the mix. You've got Roman Anthony in the outfield, Christian Campbell, both outfield and infield. Marcelo Meyer in the infield. You can add Chase Mydroth in the infield. And Kyle Teal at catcher to go along right now with Connor Wong and Mickey Gasper, Danny Jansen being a free agent. There is a lot going on there. That was a mouthful to say. And that's because the Red Sox, who already have a depth of position players that, no, not all, not all of them. In fact, mo- only a couple of them I would constitute as legitimate stars right now. But most of these guys are under contract. How many guys did I say are walking? It's pretty much O'Neill and Danny Jansen, right? Like is that might it? Need Jeff Snyder, if he retires, he's talked about that. That's true, but I don't. They Cora's like he's not. I doubt it. I think he'll come back. He's still good. He's gonna. He'll come back and like. Obviously, you could talk about guys like we we've talked about guys being trade candidates all the time. But that's the name of the show here. Is you've got a depth of guys and there are going to be trades that have to be made. And obviously number one on the Red, on what the Red Sox shopping list should be is an ace starting pitcher. We know certainly from watching this game, watching baseball for our whole lives and getting in the nitty gritty of how this stuff goes down and how it happens to get an ace, you got to give up a lot, especially if it's a controllable ace, but even for a not controllable ace, like you saw the Orioles give up Luis Ortiz do I have that right? It's Luis Ortiz, right? He hasn't played in a while, but he was good. He was good before he went down. Let me know if I have that name right. Was it a Joey? 
Joey Ortiz. Yeah. That's right. Joey Ortiz and uh, the other the pitching prospect, the cool name, whatever. DL Hall. The guy DL, with Hall. The flow. DL Hall, bro. DL Hall for a rental pitcher. And obviously the the Padres traded for two years of cease. They gave up four guys, and one of them was a legitimate dude and a couple other guys that could be good. Like you gotta give up a lot to get an ace. I want to start us off here. Who on this roster and in the minors, how many guys would you consider untouchable? Is that a thing that like is anyone ever untouchable? Okay, can I answer your question with a question? Yeah, go for it. What's the benefit of making somebody untouchable? I think there is none. I don't I think technically no one's ever untouchable, but realistically some guys are. Just I think in- the only guys that are untouchable are guys like Trevor Story on bad contracts or the reverse like, untouchable or Devers, a guy on a gigantic contract like that. Yeah, they're untouchable because you can't move them. But no, I, to answer your question and I'll frame it as the guys I'd least want to trade the guys I want. I want I don't want to know just the guys you least want to trade. I want to know the guys that you so badly want to hang on to that within reason, there is just no chance the team is going to meet that price. Honestly, nobody, there's nobody, there's not a single there's not a single person on the team that I would just say no, no matter what. Like even Roman Anthony, or if the Tigers were like, "Hey, uh, we are all simultaneously concussed, and we don't believe in this team that we've put together, even though they're playing really well, and we'd like to offer you Tarek Skubal for Roman Anthony and a few other prospects to help our rebuild, even though we're ahead of you guys right now." <clears throat> I, I would, I would, how could you say no? Like, there's no guy, Tristan Casas, same thing. Like, love Tristan Casas. Great player. I think he's going to be awesome for the next 10, 15 years. Tarek Skubal, like, come on. So, yeah, there's really nobody on the team, major league, minor league, and, and nobody in the organization that is just completely off limits to me, other than like, you know, guys who you can't trade. Like, you can't trade Trevor Story. Like but obviously, know. like if you could, you would. Oh, like, if I could, I would. So but it's, it's not like... untouchable. It's just they're not going to get traded. I want it. You. That's an interesting answer that you just gave. That that really. I. Because oh, I'm trying to think of a guy that I would trade Roman Anthony for. Scooball. Would you trade him for Scooball? If you, by the way, how the how do you pronounce that name? Scooball, Scooball, or Sco, like God, I, I hate that. Scooball. Scooball. I okay. think. I mean, I I don't know. People know what you're talking about regardless. Yeah, I feel like I've said it 16 different ways on this show. It's the first got... name. It's the first name that has me in, in a pretzel. I can't... Is it Tarek? Is it Tariq? I think it's Tarek. 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 That's like a, a, a classic European kickboxer name, dude. It's oh, yeah. Tarek. A lot of Tareks. But he... Uh, Scooble, would you do that? Like a pack... A Roman Anthony and then like... <laughs> I miss Nick York, I, man. He was so easy to throw in fake trades. <laughs> I know. Another guy that we haven't talked about enough as a guy who could have a legit impact next year is Quinn Priester, who they obviously think very highly of. But not another conversation for another day. I would not. I know Scooble's incredible. I, I'm just not interested in giving Roman Anthony up for someone who has two years or less of control. So you'd say no? Even about like, if you acquire a guy like that, it's under the impression that you're obviously going to extend him. But not always. Not always. Like if you're the give, Orioles, if you're up, Orioles aren't extending Corbin Burns. Well, the, I know, and they're like everyone's calling them a joke for it. Like ninety percent of the time, you're you're assuming that you're probably going to extend the guy. If you're the Red Sox, like come on. If you, you could to. guarantee me an extension, yeah, I'd do it. If you guarantee me an extension, but I like you like, speak to Breslow beforehand, and he says, "Yo, we're making this trade. We're going to try to extend him right away." If they think that there's a legitimate path to it and like they think that they would be able to get it done before the season, yeah, I'd probably do it. But the thing is, I just would rather target guys that I can get for like because you can get you can put together packages. Like the Red Sox have so much depth, not just in the farm system, but like talk about the outfielders. Like to add to Roman Anthony, you've got Duran, you've got Sedan, you've got Willier. And Roman's going to come up there. So someone eventually is going to have to go. Sedan's not the shortstop of the future. He's the center fielder of the future. So someone's going to have to go there. And you've got so much farm depth. We talked last episode a lot about Vaughn Grissom. And if you believe in him, 
you know, that makes Christian Campbell pretty expendable. And like Marcelo's going to come up. And like, as you said, Trevor Story is going to be really hard to move if they're going to try to go that route. So one of those young infielders could certainly get moved. And like, Chris, like a like a package headline by Christian Campbell and William Abreu gets you something really, really, really good. So I just I Campbell like I don't Abreu? See, yeah oh that, yeah dude you that's how you get like a guy like Crochet or someone unbelievable yeah, like you're not gonna get Scooble with that but you're gonna get no you could get most other guys so it's like like I'm Gilbert. not I'm not saying Rome yeah like like maybe that's yeah that's a start for Gilbert because Gilbert's got a lot of control but like. If that can, if that's a start to get Logan Gilbert, I'll add to that package to get Logan Gilbert over giving Roman Anthony for Scooble. Like if you told me that everything else was off the table and it was either Roman for Scooble or the Red Sox don't get an ace, then like I would I would be more inclined to think about it. Still still can't confidently say I would do it, just because again it's two years. So Roman Roman is to me ah. Because I don't, I don't think Duran should be untouchable. I think they should explore things there with the highest, highest tier of starting pitchers. That's who. If, if you had to, like, if I had to guess which major league player, like, okay, minor league player, I said last episode. I think the guy who I, who I think will be moved, if there is a move, I think it would be Christian Campbell. Major league, I'd say Duran. I, I, in terms of who I think would be the most likely to go, I agree with you. I think I, I, I don't know if. I don't know if that's getting enough play and maybe it's because we haven't hit the off season yet. And people just want to appreciate his season. And like the media doesn't want to necessarily, you know, we're willing to go there, talk off season a lot, but I think, you know, the, the general media that has to put out stories every day kind of wants to save that stuff for the off season, which is totally fair. Um, no, it's not cowards. Talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> I want it now. We want trades now in, in September. Fuck the, fuck the deadline. Do it now. Yeah. Do it now. But no, I agree with you. I agree with you. I I just I have a feeling that this could be I mean, he's got four years of control after this year and he's coming off just such an unbelievable season. And I and we know just based off of I mean, I, I always think back to Chris Cotillo saying before the season started and even right after they extended Sedan, like for for like a the better part of a month. He was saying he thought the most likely Red Sox player to get extended would be William Abreu, and he's done nothing but prove them right. I know he's going through a like a pretty severe slump right now. Obviously, he had the severe slump to start the season, but overall, Williams had an incredible year, and he looks like the type of guy that is going to age well. So, and it's just has been good in all facets of the game. You know, even as like a base runner, I don't think he's going to be a, like a great base runner forever, but. He swung the bat super well. He's played one of the best defensive right fields in Major League Baseball, which is so important at Fenway. And obviously that's something that Duran is not going to be able to do because he just doesn't have the arm for it. So even though my choice with all that would be to keep the most electric player on your team and just ride that out and get what you can out of it production-wise, I agree with you. I think they're going to see this as potentially a sell-high opportunity with Duran and an easy way without dealing – several different pieces to get that ace because four years of Duran should be able to get you almost anything you want. Yeah. I mean, that's almost, uh, I mean, that would work with, that would be a Mariners pitcher trade, right. I think because Chicago, if you want crochet or Miami, if you want one of their guys, they're going to want prospects. So if you're thinking Duran, you have, I think you should be thinking Seattle. Cause well, you need control gonna... to me. I, I, I think if you deal Duran for someone with, with two years of control or less, you're out of your mind. Yeah, I think all the Mariners guys have more than that. They so do. I don't think it would be. They do. Yeah, they they all do, and they. I don't. I don't know. Ooh, Gilbert might be at three. I think that might be the lowest it gets. I think it's Gilbert three, Kirby four, Miller and Wu five. If I'm not Logan mistaken. Gilbert. Let me see. Yeah, he's a free. Yeah, he's got three years left. Yeah. Arb, 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 free agent in 2028 at age 31, though. So they might extend him before, but who knows? But yeah, so Dur I mean, Duran, I'm to go back to it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't label him untouchable just because I think if, just if, if you traded him and brought up Roman Anthony, like it wouldn't be my first choice to do it. But like 
your offense, your like your bats would still be really good. You'd have to figure out the leadoff position, but again, Roman's done that. Roman. Yeah. yeah, he's done that. So like that could be. I mean, that could be the plan. We might just might have just uncovered the plan right there. But I want to talk about another one because I, like Roman Anthony might be the only one I actually think is close to untouchable in the minors. I again, a, no real untouchables. Like if the Mariners wanted to give me like I don't know Gilbert and Wu for Roman Anthony, of course I'm going to take it. So like yeah, there's a price. There's a price for everybody. Like. But let's go back to the big league level. One guy who I who I won't say is untouchable because it's the wrong word, but just coming off the season that he's had, there is no reasonable team that would give what I would have to get to trade this guy. And to me, it's Tristan Casas, who I still, as a player, even obviously this year has not gone the way he would have planned. Obviously, that is almost exclusively due to the injury. Uh, I, I, I'm sure you agree with that. Like. Yeah. If he okay. if he had stayed healthy the whole year, this guy was going to have a, a huge year. To me, I still think the Red Sox have the next Joey Votto or Freddie Freeman sitting right there in your organization playing first base for you. Obviously, like he's a weird dude, and like we love that about him that he's willing to, you know, be true to himself. And I can appreciate the hell out of that. I it always weirds me out when fans can't appreciate that because like they see him say interesting stuff, like he gets fired up by seeing Trevor Story naked in the shower. <laughs> And but like I, it get, I I posted that and there was there were way too many people who said like this guy's weird trade him that's insane to me like I that's one of my favorite things about him but another thing I love about him is that I just think he's going to be one of the premier hitters in the sport for a long time I want him on my team and I think if you trade him now a it's going to come with a lot of maneuvering which I guess we could talk about in this episode uh, with either needing to get a new first baseman or move Devers over and get a new third baseman. Um, But I think you'd be selling low on, on a guy who I still think is going to be one of the better hitters in baseball. So is there, is there, I obviously, again, understanding that no one is untouchable. Is there a realistic world where you see the Red Sox finding or being offered a package that entices you enough to deal Tristan Casas? Yeah, again, this is another guy that I think would only make sense with Seattle. Seattle seems like the most obvious trade partner with the Red Sox that I could possibly think of. But um, it it would be contingent on a team willing to pay full price, you know, quote unquote, full price, I guess you could say. Like they'd have to be paying for the guy we saw in 2023 and his future, not a guy who got hurt and missed time. Um, And, you know, it's hard to say if a team is going to be willing to do that. I, I there's no way to tell without speaking to him and breaking news. We can't do that. So, uh, yeah, I, I would move Casas if it meant getting a, an ace type pitcher, but I don't. I would be I would be shocked, and it's far from my first choice, just because like they have such a surplus of outfielders. And I know, I know, I know, nerds, outfielders more valuable than first baseman, defensive value. I get it, I get it, but you only have so many roster spots, so. Um, I'd rather deal from the surplus, uh, but that said, like I, I'm I'm moving anybody if it means getting an ace pitcher. I okay, guess so- I guess the one guy closest to untouchable and impossible to move anyway. I guess it would be Devers because if you if you move Devers, you just like lose your soul. I feel, but it doesn't matter because he's on a three hundred thirty million dollar deal, so there's no shot he gets moved. But um, to to answer your question from ten minutes ago. <laughs> There you have it. So let me let me ask you this because Ken Rosenthal wrote an article that I think ruffled some feathers amongst Red Sox fans. I think a lot of people didn't love the idea he presented. And his suggestion was sign Alex Bregman. The Red Sox should sign Alex Bregman to be your third baseman. Raphael Devers moves over to first base. And then Tristan Costas gets traded for a Mariners starting pitcher. I want to ask you, and I, I have my opinions on this, which I'll give, but I want to give you the first crack at it. First, on a scale of like, I don't know, just tell me your like love it or hate it thoughts on the idea. And second, you, you talked about you would trade anyone for an ace. Tell me out of the four Mariners starting pitchers that we keep talking about, Gilbert, Kirby, Wu, Miller, 
Which of those guys, if any, would you be willing to trade Tristan Costas straight up for? Uh, I don't think you could get Kirby for him, but I would obviously do that. Kirby's, I think the... Actually, no, I wouldn't say he's the best of the bunch. I think Gilbert is he the way I go. Him. Because Gilbert him. Gilbert's had an unreal season. Like, I think he has the lowest whip in Major League Baseball, but he's only got three years of control compared to four. So maybe, maybe Casas and a little bit more would get that done. Um, Brian Wu might have the best stuff out of all those guys, but the injury problems are pretty significant in like multiple areas. So I would, I would stay away from him. And then Bryce Miller, another awesome option, spin doctor. He's got that fastball that's like 94, but it looks like it's 98. So, um, would probably do one for one him and Casas, but I don't know if Seattle would. Uh, that's yeah, that's I, the next question I have for you. Would Seattle would Seattle entertain it for any of them? For Casas? understanding understanding where they are offensively as a team. I don't know, man. It's a Seattle's such a like a graveyard for guys who hit like Casas. It's such a big ballpark with like that thick Pacific Northwest air. I feel like a guy like Duran would tickle their fancy just a bit more, like a slasher with speed, a doubles guy, plays good defense as well. So um but also they are they have i don't know man i don't know i think they prefer duran but who knows i mean costas is a great piece too well it's Maybe. interesting it's interesting to me because and and i we will get back to this rosenthal article because we got to give our takes on that but the it's interesting because to me if you ask me who would you rather deal for one of the mariners starting pitchers duran or costas duran is obviously as it stands right now, the better player. He's one of the best players in baseball. I would still feel better dealing Duran for one of those guys than Casas just because of where the Red Sox stand. A, from a power perspective. B, from an outfield perspective. Like, it just, you don't, there's a lot of, there's a lot of what ifs that go into dealing Casas because part of that obviously is the moving Devers to first and in this case, signing Bregman to play third. I think the benefits of Bregman are he's a right-handed hitter in a, in a lineup that obviously lacks it. He can hit for power and you know has shown that he can use a short left field porch to his advantage. Uh, he is elite at making contact and plays terrific defense. So he fits in all the areas that the Red Sox need. Obviously, the issue is this is going to be a big money contract, $150 million plus. I've seen... Uh, some media people talking approaching two hundred million dollars for Alex Bregman. That's a lot of money for a guy who has been on the downward swing basically since. I mean, he peaked early. I got to pull up his numbers, but this is not a guy. I think it, it's. I think he's now. No, I think last year he had an OPS just over eight hundred, but this year it's. Like I got his. I got his. I got his numbers right here. If you want him, like his OPS yeah. from by year, like starting in twenty nineteen, he's yeah, in start the, there. Uh, 1,000, Jesus, oh my God, 1,015 in uh, 2019. That's the year he really, actually, no, he really broke out in 2018 with a 926. And then he has a 1,000 the following year. And then he's down to 801. That was 2020. That was kind of a weird season anyway. 2021, he got hurt, missed time, only 777. But then he bounced back 820. And then last year, 804. So trending down, but it's not like he's, falling off a cliff well then this year too 749 this year yeah so that's like that's tough, man. That's, it's that's probably it's a problem because it's like it's like it's like you go into the into like the draft what do they always say when when talking about draft draft the best player don't draft for fit and obviously with with free agency you can sign for fit but you don't want to commit like a six or seven year deal to a guy who may never hit for an 800 ops Throughout the duration of the contract, like that's that's nuts to me. I just like I couldn't do it. Something didn't he have like some issue this year? I'm looking right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Elbow issue, but he also had an elbow issue. Oh, two months in a row, wrist. Yikes. Okay, this is freaking me out. This year alone, June hand injury. <laughs> One week later, wrist injury. August elbow injury. September elbow injury. <laughs> So, I mean, that explains the OPS, but, like, ew. It's tough because, like, again, like, we talk about what do the Red Sox need. They need right-handed hitting. They need contact. 
Like they need defense. leadership. Another yeah, defense, defense, defense and leadership. Like we've talked about all of these things being deficiencies, but like, are you a better offensive team with by bringing in Alex Bregman and trading Tristan Casas? Even though you might fix some of the problems, if you ask me, are you a better offensive team? I lean towards no. And two things, by the way, two things worth noting: Bregman will be thirty-one. Uh, before or on opening day, March 30th. So it's going to be age 31 season. Red Sox don't love giving contracts to those guys. Uh, and then two, guess who his agent is? You might have heard of him. Scotty B. Scotty B, who might change things up this year after how big of a disaster uh, 2023. Oh, he's out for blood. He's out yeah. for blood. Yeah, he might be. So I was actually talking uh, today with some people about Bregman, I think he's the kind of guy who signs in like February because very good player, like we've been discussing, but he's coming off a season in which his numbers are down. He's 30 now, going to be 31 next season, uh, banged up, like, but again, he's still good. So how, what, what, what team fits that need? Like, where does he fit? I, I think he's a great fit with the Red Sox for a year or two. And he's not going to take a two-year deal. So I don't know, man. That's tough. That's if he were 27, I would be screaming to the heavens to sign this guy. Give him six years. I don't care. But at his age 31 season, uh, I don't know, Breggy. It's tough because like the Red Sox of old, I would have I would have been saying, yeah, just do it because I mean he's a good player. He he fits the needs. But the issue is now you have to be thinking if they sign Alex Bregman. Not only is that like a roster spot, a position filled for the next X amount of years, and we've seen how that's impacted decision making with with Trevor Story in the fold and with Masataka Yoshida in the fold. Like those guys being locked in changed decisions. But also, like the the main thing is that's a giant investment, and the Red Sox have shown that if they make a giant investment, that's like that's like their move. Like that's the move. If you make one big investment, like that might be it for this year and next year and the year after. You might wait a few more years before you make another one. I so was gonna say that's the move better be for, sure. for a while. That's the move. So, like, is Alex Bregman really that guy? Like, the, the two questions I need to like, I I wish I knew the answer. Like, are they willing to top two hundred fifty million dollars for the right guy for the right external player, or is that just not something they're ever going to be willing to do? Because I don't like, think so. Because I, I think, if, dude, I think they might be done spending big in free agency for the foreseeable future. Like, because when you think about it, every big free agent is normally around age, what, 29, 30? Because that's when their rookie contract ends. All the big, big, big ones. The Red Sox are just going to say, no, they're too old. They don't fit our timeline. And then all the young guys that they want and would be acquired in a trade. So I just don't, I can't envision many scenarios where they're spending big, barring a change in philosophy where they go out and they're like, all right, let's go get Max Freed. We need an ace. Corbin Burns. Let's go. But uh, like I said earlier this episode and on our last episode, I don't think... I don't foresee that at all. I got, I'm kind of like you. I got to I gotta see it before I believe it at this point. I've, I've had too much false hope in this front office the last few years, and I just can't make my brain do it again. Yeah, we've been hurt way too many times. And like it's frustrating because you the needs are obvious, and there's ways to fill those needs and holes that can be filled with both free agents and trades that can be had. And I think the reason we keep gravitating towards the trade conversations is because we've been hurt too many times hoping that they're going to spend but they have to trade like Same that's why we keep talking about it honestly man like i've been hoping i thought they were going to swing a big trade like how many times this off season did we say they gotta do something like this is the time and then halfway through we all kind of pivoted like maybe next year would be the time like they're gonna ride with their ace is gonna be bayo uh, there's a difference though be- sammy the, the, there's a key difference though because last year we said those things because the major league team looked like it needed it this year, if they don't trade, like they're just gonna have, they're gonna, they're not gonna, they're gonna have too many players for the roster. In, in theory, you could kick the can down the road another year and just keep big league caliber players playing in Triple A. But at a certain point in time, guys run out of options. Like they, yeah. they have to make trades at some, like whether it be this year or next year, there's gonna be two, maybe even three moves that are gonna knock your socks off just because the Red Sox have have not traded from young players from legitimate pros they have not traded legitimate prospects or controllable players like they've traded big leaguers on like short 
feels like they've traded Chris Sale with a year left. They've Isn't traded like big. Who, who, I, I'm, I can't even think. I, I know it's all. It's also one in the morning as we record. But I'm trying to think who is the last big time trade acquisition they made. I'm not talking like like a big sell off trade like Sale. I mean like maybe it I'll was Sale. You. It, I well okay it depends on how big you're talking because they didn't do anything like literally work backwards they they didn't Heim never traded prospects of like of consequence like I've traded, never traded I've never he, traded he traded for Schwarber but he gave up close to nothing so I don't and that was a rental so I don't I don't know if you want to count that so before Heim 2019 the Red Sox only got Cashner at the deadline and they didn't trade for anything before then so go to 18 the deadline they got evaldi but that's a rental steve pierce obviously was huge but a rental and was not seen as a consequential thing even there. evaldi was like a three or a four at the time they got him he wasn't supposed right. to be a huge piece he was just to supplement that rotation yeah dude i think i think you're right i think the last big time legitimate like knock your socks off trade they made was for sale yeah that's so depressing <laughs> I mean, the the rebuild to get back to this point with the farm system took way, 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 way too long. Do you think that a team like the Red Sox with a massive, massive payroll historically should ever have to do a minor league system rebuild? Like, major league team rebuild, sure, but a minor league system rebuild? Yankees never do that. Well, it's the Yankees go through ups and... Uh, uh, I mean, the, the issue is their downs are never that down, but that's because they're spent. They're always spending at the big league level. Like the Red Sox did rebuild between like twenty, like they blew up the 2011, 2012 team and they rebuilt it into what you saw in 2016, 17, 18. No, I agree. I think everyone has to rebuild at the major league level eventually, but to, to take time off from contending at the major league level, in, it, to intentionally rebuild because the Red Sox no, are like that's but that's different that's that is a no no right. I think I think you can run out of shit in the farm because you traded so much of it going for a major league window like that's okay but the issue is you you like you have to understand when that window is expiring when guys are at you know when guys are sellable with like a year or two left and it's just not going to happen you're not going to compete for that championship and trade them then or you got to be willing to spend for big leaguers to bridge you to the next gap if you're not going to restock the farm system by trading those guys. You can't have it both ways. Sox, like they sold low on Ben and Tendi. Uh, they sold with just a year left on Mookie and chose to salary dump David Price by doing it. They let a lot of guys like Xander and JD and Ivaldi walk in I free mean, agency. Do, like, I mean, what you just you you quickly went over that, but the Mookie one plus attaching David Price's contract, that's one of the most shameful moments in the history of the entire franchise like that yep. is that that is you really don't get any worse than that Mookie still it's been six years or five years since he's left and he's still one of the best players now he's a fucking shortstop dude like it's ridiculous so um no but Sammy like if the Red so like the Red Sox if they'd either been willing to spend on like a bridge like a bridge of three-year deals for like good but not great players to bridge you to kind of the era that you're entering right now where guys like Casas and Bayo and Duran come up and now you've got the next crop with like Meyer and Anthony and Teal and Campbell. Like if they had bridged with like legitimate three-year like good players to get to this point and spent the money to do it, it would have been palatable. And if they had traded those guys that we just talked about if they traded all of them and maybe sold Mookie at if they if they knew they were going to sell Mookie in before 2020, they should have traded him at the 2019 deadline and gotten more for him. If they'd handled things the right way, like we wouldn't have had to endure what we are still enduring to this day as we wait for that next Red Sox team to to truly peek its head out and be real, real postseason contenders. <sighs> Painful. I don't know, man. That's. So many, so many moments you can look back on the last up uh, back until like 2020 where you're just like, why did the Red Sox not do X or why did they do X? It didn't make sense at the time. It doesn't make sense now. Ugh. The only one that in hindsight kind of looks good now, I think, 
is not bringing back Xander, which at the time was like catastrophic, but he has not aged well. Um, and obviously they were not going to give him more than 11 years, 280 million. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it feels weird. It feels like we, it, we don't know who the Red Sox are anymore. So we'll see. Maybe, maybe things change this off season with Craig Breslow. At least he's shown a little bit more, uh, willingness to be aggressive on the fringes than Heim Bloom. Yeah. I mean, like the, the moves that Heim did make, you can like, there was there were some that were met with scrutiny, like in particular the Vasquez deal, where you got William Abreu and Valdez there. Like that was met with a lot of scrutiny at the time, and that turned out well. The one that I shat on the most was trading Renfro to get Jackie, but they got and the main piece was seen like Alex Benelis, but actually David Hamilton came in that deal, so that one looks a lot better. But I think I think a lot of the issues it's the moves he didn't make and the indecisiveness and kicking the can down the road and you think that it's going to allow you to maintain flexibility, but actually it just ends up hamstringing you at deadlines to make bad decisions and not get value for guys. And, and it, and it delayed this build. So, I mean, it's obviously like they're going to come out on the other side, whether they spend or not, like they just have too much talent to not come out on the other side. Like they'd have to mismanagement, mismanage it pretty badly to not end up, like obviously they're going to have amazing left-handed hitters. Like that's going to be a thing. But they would have to mismanage mismanage it pretty badly to not turn this thing into an offensive juggernaut in the future and probably into a at least reasonable pitching rotation either by developing it, trading for it, or hopefully spending on it. But that's a good amount of time for this one, Sammy, unless you got anything left. I don't know if you have any enough said. I don't know if I have enough said today. Um, I do have enough said for today. Um, I don't know if you have heard of him. The uh, Dodgers have a guy named Shohei Otani. He's on the team. I think he's from like Japan. Uh, and he's, he's okay. Uh, today he hit three home runs to become the first 50, 50 guy. And then on top of that, he stole two bases and drove in 10 runs. For the Dodgers, that is 10-1-0 runs he drove in today with his three home runs and six hits, by the way. So, uh, yeah, decent day for this Otani guy. I think he has a future in this league. And uh, I'm really thrilled that the Red Sox barely made an effort to acquire him. And by the way, he might also uh, pitch for the Dodgers in the postseason, which uh, they're going to be playing in because they have... Uh, Drafted well, developed well, signed big name players, made smart trades. So, uh, congrats to the Dodgers, and uh, thank you, Red Sox, for not trying to get Shohei Otani. Thank God, we don't have to watch that guy make history every single night. Do you remember? And he's he's insanely good. It's insane. We've never seen anything like it. But do you remember at the end of last season, probably like or literally at this time a year ago, when like there were I think like Peter Gammons. And Will Middlebrooks both put something out there that the Red Sox and Shohei Otani might be a thing, and we all went absolutely nuts thinking no, that I did not. I I never went nuts. Okay. Remember no, my no, no. percentage thing? Not, none of us. Yeah, I know. None of us ever actually, actually, actually went nuts. But like that shit being out there, like even even if it didn't mean they were going to get Shohei, like it had us going. Like yeah, kind of. it I made, can't it, even envision it. I couldn't even at the time, like I dude, couldn't even that, think in the Red Sox jersey. That mixed like with that. the full throttle shit. Like that that had us going. We we come on, going into last offseason, we were fully convinced the Red Sox were gonna get Yamamoto. Yeah, that's who I thought they were gonna get. I thought they were gonna actually make an effort to go after Yamamoto. Who knows what they actually offered him, by the way. They haven't revealed it. They were super excited to reveal their Imanaga offer. Um, but they didn't even mention what they're, they just gave like a vague, like, Oh, it was in the neighborhood of something. Yeah. There, there's a reason. There's a reason for that. We, we know damn well why they didn't reveal their, their Yamamoto offer. Yeah. Well, if you don't think they offered him $400 million, you're a liar. Oh God. That, that saga will forever. You ready for another round of that dude, a whole nother, like five months of that bullshit. Dude, that, Last off season, starting this podcast and talking about 
all of that stuff three days a week and just living every single moment of it because we were so tapped in with everything that was going on. Not just not just because we have the podcast, but it's it's because we're who we are. We like we're gonna be tapped into this shit whether the Red Sox are signing everybody or signing nobody, and just like basically telling the story of last off season through the podcast. It was like obviously awesome to have this podcast and we love doing it, but it also just brought so much extra pain. Like, yeah. oh by the way, God. uh, can I read you Shohei Otani's 2024 stat line so far? Yeah, please. So he's posted pretty much every day, 599 at bats. He scored 123 runs, 176 hits. So he's going to be close to 200, 51 home runs, 51 stolen bases, 120 RBIs, gets on base more than 37% of the time, and he has a 1,005 OPS. But Gordo, he's actually not that good because he's not really providing any defensive value. So Shohei Otani's not as good as a guy like Dalton Varsho. The leader in defensive war in Major League Baseball, Dalton Varsho. Yeah, really, a lot of guys watch Shohei Otani, but uh, uh, a real ball knower like me knows Dalton Varsho. All right, uh, when Dalton Varsho's name enters the chat, that means we got to get the fuck out of here. So we appreciate you guys tuning in to episode 133 of Play Tessie. Before you get going, without go about your day. God, it is so late at night. Uh, we appreciate Joe Braverman, our producer, extra, 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 extra today uh, doing this. But subscribe. Rate us five stars. Subscribe wherever you're listening, wherever you get your podcasts. As always, find us on YouTube on the WEI channel. We've got a Play Tessie playlist there where you can find all of our episodes. And you can find us on the socials at Play Tessie on both Twitter and Instagram. So for Sammy and for Big Brave Dog Joe Braveman, producer Joe Braveman, it is Gordo here for Play Tessie. Thanks for tuning into this one. Peace. <laughs>